Hello. My name is Harris M. Berger, and I'm director of MMAP, the research center for the study of music, media, and place here at Memorial University of Newfoundland. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here to this, the fourth talk in the center's 2017-2018 Music and Culture Lecture Series. I'll start this evening by reading Memorial University's land acknowledgement statement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothuk and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothuk. We would like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Innu of Nidasinin and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful partnerships with all the people of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. It is my great pleasure to introduce this evening my colleague and friend, tonight's music and culture lecturer, Dr. Ellen Waterman. Waterman is a researcher and musician whose work has had an extraordinary scope and impact. Across her scores of publications, performances, and initiatives, Waterman has made a remarkable set of contributions to the humanities, humanistic social sciences, and arts in North America and around the world. Her diverse projects are so distinguished, so varied, and yet so in intricately interconnected that anyone with the job of introducing her faces a delightful challenge. Dr. Waterman, I'll do my best. Take, for example, her research publications. Waterman's scholarship is centered at the meeting place of improvisation studies, sound studies, gender studies, and ethnomusicology. Through three books and dozens of book chapters and articles, Waterman explores the complex ways in which musicians, listeners, and sound artists use musical improvisation and soundscape performance to make sense of gender and race, grapple with technologies, and think about their experiences as embodied subjects. Publishing articles in a broad range of leading journals, Waterman's work shows the importance of improvisation for a wide variety of fields and topics in contemporary music studies, from music therapy and music education to sexuality, media, ecology, the body, and more. Her book, Art of Immersive Soundscapes, co-edited by Waterman and Pauline Minovich, explores the extraordinary diversity in contemporary sonic art from media like film, video, and radio, to live music performance, sound stints, installations, and beyond. Her most recent book, Negotiated Moments, Improvisation, Sound, and Subjectivity, co-edited by Gillian Sidal and published by Duke University Press, understands improvisation as a material practice, a site of politics, and a place where performers have the potential to form new kinds of agency. Waterman's work has been recognized with grants, fellowships, and visiting professorships from some of the most prestigious funding agencies and institutions in the Western Academy, including SHRC, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, the University of Cambridge, and McGill University, to name but a few. Waterman's role in the development of improvisation studies is not limited to her publications. She is a co-investigator and memorial site coordinator for the International Institute for Critical Studies in Improvisation, IC, an organization partnered across six universities, including Memorial, the University of Guelph, McGill University, the University of British Columbia, the University of Regina, and the University of California at Santa Barbara. Funded by a multi-million dollar SHRC partnership grant, IC has research, publication, and public engagement dimensions, and its work has implications for fields of endeavor that range from the humanities, social sciences, and arts, to education, healthcare, and government. Along with Ajay Hebley and Frederica Royas, Waterman is the founding editor of Critical Studies Improvisation, IC's peer-reviewed journal, and her work with the Institute has been instrumental in making improvisation studies one of the most vibrant areas of arts and humanities research today. And it is not only improvisation studies that has benefited from her forward-thinking administration. As everyone in this room knows, Waterman served from 2010 to 2015 as the Dean of Memorial's School of Music, where she was instrumental in the continued development of our graduate program in ethnomusicology and of MMAP. If all that were not enough, Waterman is an enormously accomplished flutist who has concertized in leading venues across North America and Europe for almost 30 years. Her career is a testament to the ways that research, creative work, teaching, service, and administration enrich one another. Indeed, her efforts in all of these areas has enriched us all.
The, talk of her ta the title of her talk this evening is The Idea of the North, Post-Nationalism, and the Changing Ecolo Ecology of Experimental Music in Canada. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you this evening Dr. Ellen Waterman. Thank you, Harry, for your kind introduction and for your invitation to share my research on experimental music performance in Canada. I also want to give a big shout out to Megan Forsyth and to Spencer Crew and to the wonderful graduate students, uh, Ellen McCutcheon and Kristen Dobble, who are working tech tonight. When I embarked on this project in 2003, I wanted to understand how experimental music in Canada is performative, how it makes meaning, how it produces identity and culture. Because there was relatively little academic work available on Canadian experimental music at that time, I decided that a necessary preliminary step was to map experimental music across the country. So that's my map of the 12 research sites that I chose in 2003 across Canada. I selected 12 sites of intensive activity, mainly festivals and artist-run centers from Newfoundland to BC. Such breadth and longevity, spanning 5,000 kilometers and 15 years, means that I have witnessed both rapidly changing practices and the exciting growth of research in experimental music and sound in Canada. That big hole in the prairies there could easily be filled if I was selecting sites today. But northern sites remain a challenge, and I want you to notice how my, my sites just kind of cross the 49th uh, parallel. Experimental music has recently gained a lot of momentum in music studies, in part due to the recognition that the experimental impulse, as putatively fathered by John Cage, is by no means limited to the outsider fringe of the musical avant-garde, but is in fact pervasive in a diverse arts ecosystem in which genre lines and artistic disciplines are increasingly blurred. Scholars and artists such as Jeremy Strawn, Kate Galloway, Chris Tonelli, Teresa Connors, and Parmela Atarawala are doing fantastic work on Canadian experimental music. The conceptual frame for my study is ecology, and that merits a bit of explanation. Today, there are any number of ecological theories that posit the urgent need to rethink our ontologies of nature and culture in order to reconceptualize humans and everything else as interconnected and interdependent in the face of environmental crisis. Such theories range from the Anthropocene, the idea that the current epoch is defined by humans' impact on the planet, to post-humanism, with its emphasis on technology, and the Capitalocene, with its emphasis on global trade, power, and profit. Donna Haraway has recently suggested the tentacular image of the Cthulhu scene, which she defines as a, quote, kind of time place for learning to stay with the trouble of living and dying in response ability on a damaged earth. I love that response ability, the ability to respond. For Haraway, bounded individualism has simply become unavailable to think with. Instead, she insists that we must seek to understand how nature and culture are co-produced through sympoesis, a process of making with. Well now, what does a comparative ethnography of experimental music festivals in Canada have to do with the future of the planet? Haraway and other theorists of ecology help us to think about the entanglement of arts practice with all kinds of factors, space, place, ideas, human and non-human materials and resources. Haraway's terms, responsibility and sympoesis, are highly resonant with the co-creative processes and on-the-fly resourcefulness that I observe in experimental music. Taking an ecological approach to experimental music has in fact attracted a number of scholars, notably Benjamin Pickett's work with Latourian Actor Network Theory and Georgina Bourne's systematic description of musical assemblages as an analytic tool. The ecological turn is by no means new in Canadian experimental music, where it is associated with the term acoustic ecology, itself derived from the made in Canada field of soundscape studies. According to composer Hildegard Westerkamp, the World Soundscape Project, founded in Burnaby, BC by composer Armory Schaefer in the late 1960s, 
has always recognized the special role that music plays in our sound environment. She states, soundscape ideology recognizes this and the irony of musicians who are all too often concerned with the details of their art only, deaf to a world out of tune, and ignoring the social, political, and environmental context and the implication of their work. The World Soundscape Project actively encounters this situation by connecting diverse and disconnected disciplines dealing with sound, and thus placing music within the larger context of the sound environment." Close quote. Westerkramp's description explicitly links nature and culture through situated knowledge produced by examining music and sound in specific social, political, and environmental context. Now, ethnomusicologist Anna Maria Ochoa Gautier also connects the critical discourse of acoustic ecology with both experimental music and the eruption of the ecological era, as she puts it, in the 1970s. In her great article, Acoustic Multinaturalism, she states, quote, through its 40-year history, such experimental work has generated intense debate, not only about notions of sound and the implication of recording the sounds of nature, but also more recently about an increasing set of polemics on the nature of acoustic representation and the question of the real." Close quote. Ochoa Gautier goes on, however, to caution against a too positivist conception of sound and music. She says, the ecologization of sound is closely associated with the notion that music, sound, and listening are understood as that which politically resolves the separation between nature and the human, or the conflictive relations between humans, understood as part of the ecological crisis. This corresponds to a conceptualization of music as that which produces community, and of listening as the much-needed suture for the torn relations both between humans and between humans and the environment." Close quote. Music will not save us, she's saying. While not denying the socio-political dimensions of music and sound, Ochoa Gautier, rightly in my view, critiques the assumption of efficacy. But with that caution firmly in mind, I want to suggest to the extent that acoustic ecology is a method for critical listening and creative response, it can provide a useful framework for understanding the entanglement of musical performances in the broader physical, social, and cultural environment. In tonight's talk, I'll address elements of music composition and performance. And I will also look at the influential factor of public arts funding in the Canadian arts ecosystem in order to address the changing ecology of music in Canada. I ask, how is experimental music entangled with evolving discourses of Canadian identity? One answer, I contend, lies in our long history of associating Canadian identity with geographic location, the idea of North which runs deep in our visual art, literature, and music. But another answer concerns a shift in this discourse in the late 20th century towards an understanding of Canada as defined by values of diversity, including, more recently, a renewed attention to Indigenous people in the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This new sensibility has been characterized by some, including Prime Minister Trudeau, as evidence of Canada's evolution towards post-nationalism. The idea of North is a long-standing trope for the production of Canadian identity. And as such, it goes well beyond its geographic reference. Philosopher and founder of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, John Ralston Saul, has made an explicit connection between experimentalism and Canadian identity. For Saul, the idea of North evokes animism, which seems to me to be highly resonant with Haraway's Cthulhu scene. Saul states, the Canadian sensibility is that of the edge, the unknown, the uncontrolled. In the art this produces, there is an assumption, sometimes consciously political, sometimes unconsciously creative, sometimes both, that place and art are the same thing. Not place in the common physical sense, but place in the sense of the whole, the animist idea of borderless inclusion." Close quote. Saul cautions, ecologically, that the location of art within a mythic and borderless sense of place must lie in delicate balance with reality. As he puts it, 
in a whole series of equilibriums. Given that balance, he believes that animism can act as a regenerative ideal for a pluralistic Canada whose strength is its non-conformity to the monolithic identity of the finished nation state. More recently, Ralston Stahl has expanded this concept of a borderless sense of place toward an emphasis on diversity and a controversial Canadian genealogy based on the indigenous concept of welcome, however betrayed by colonialism, asserting that Canada has transcended the idea of nation to become the world's first post-national state. As Charles Foran, CEO of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, explained in an op-ed, there is more than one story in all this. First and foremost, post-nationalism is a frame to understand our ongoing experiment in filling a vast yet unified geographic space with the diversity of the world. It is also a half-century-old intellectual project, born of the country's awakening from colonial slumber. But post-nationalism has also been in intermittent practice for centuries, since long before the nation-state of Canada was formalized in 1867. In some sense, we have always been thinking differently about this continent-wide landmass, using ideas borrowed from indigenous societies. From the moment Europeans began arriving in North America, they were made welcome by the locals, taught how to survive and thrive amid multiple identities and allegiances. That welcome was often betrayed, in particular during the late 19th and 20th centuries, when settler Canada did profound harm to indigenous people. But if the imbalance remains, so too does the influence, the model of another way of belonging." Close quote. The concept of post-nationalism has been critiqued as a gateway to unbridled transnationalism that might lead to a loss of Canadian sovereignty. Vancouver Sun columnist Douglas Todd attributed the rising house prices in Vancouver, partly due to uh, laws that allow for foreign ownership, to post-nationalism. Critics of Ralston Saul have also wondered whether he too easily positions indigenous peoples as the founders of Canadianness, particularly given the history of colonialism and the current work of indigenous peoples to reclaim their cultural sovereignty. For Trudeau and Ralston Saul, clearly, Post-nationalism is a strategic position meant to differentiate Canada from resurgent European and American nationalism. To me, post-nationalism feels like a new twist on the old idea of North. For much of the 20th century, the idea of North evoked the wilderness sublime, a vast and largely empty frozen wilderness and a perceived ruggedness and purity that was mapped onto both the landscape and its inhabitants. It is an idea that permeates not just Canadian music, but also literature and painting, from Lauren Harris's icy abstracted landscapes, here shown in a poster for a 2015 international retrospective exhibition called The Idea of North, to Margaret Atwood's 1991 Oxford lectures entitled Strange Tales, The Malevolent North in Canadian Literature in which Atwood asks the question, what do we mean by the North? She states, until you get to the North Pole, North being a direction is relative. The North is thought of as a place, but it's a place with shifting boundaries. It's also a state of mind. It can mean wilderness or frontier. But we know or think we know what sorts of things go on there. In the Canadian north of popular image, the Mounties with their barking dog teams relentlessly pursue madmen through the snow. Prospectors stumble raving out of the bush, clutching their little bags of gold dust. Jolly voyageurs rollick in their canoes. Indians rescue hapless whites who get endlessly lost in the woods. Wolves devour lone hunters, or not, as the case may be. Eskimos, well, you get the picture. Over time, the chief features of the terrain, the signposts, have remained strangely consistent, although the values ascribed to them have varied considerably. And note that Atwood's anachronistic nomenclature, Indians, Eskimos, Mounties, mirrors the historical body of literature and imagery that she's discussing. But it's literature and imagery very much from my generation's childhood, for example, reading Jack London's Call of the Wild and so forth. Canada is not, of course, alone in identifying as a northern nation. 
The eight other circumpolar countries, including Russia, Finland, and Greenland, have their own distinctive ideas of North. Furthermore, the geographic conception of North is regionally inflected within Canada, a country that has a population density of just four people for each of its nine million square kilometers of land area. And land area doesn't include water, so that's four people for each of nine million square kilometers of land area. In a 1965 newsletter, the Royal Bank of Canada described the territory north of 60 as, quote, one of the last large underdeveloped pieces of real estate in the world, unquote. A description that underlines a long history of treating the north as an opportunity for resource extraction to the benefit of southerners. This attitude continues to this day, as painfully illustrated by the 2015 tragic mass suicide of impoverished Attawapiskat First Nations youth in northern Ontario whose reservation, which lacks safe water and adequate community health care, is right next door to a diamond mine run by De Beers, an international company accused in 2015 of skirting its tax obligations to Ontario. The North, as Cheryl Grace comprehensively documents in her fascinating book, Canada and the Idea of North, is both real and imagined. Now, the idea of North was first expressed in Canadian experimental music in Glenn Gould's famous 1967 polyphonic radio documentary of the same name, and made manifest in R. Murray Schaefer's environmental compositions and polemical writings from the 1960s through the 2000s. Gould's idea of North was commissioned by the CBC for Canada's 1967 centennial celebrations and later adapted for television. It has been analyzed both as an experimental radio documentary and as an experimental composition. Here, the idea of North is presented from the perspectives of five people with years of experience living north of 60. A nurse, a sociologist, a civil servant, an anthropologist slash geographer, and a philosopher. None are indigenous. The whole is set against a soundscape of wind and snow and the keynote clackety-clack sound of the train signaling the long journey north. Grace sees Gould's program as a good model for the complexity of the idea of North because of the way that he overlaps and fragments the voices so that no one point of view dominates. For Grace, quote, inevitably each character turns to the question of the relationship of the North to the rest of Canada, to the idea of nation, and to the way the North shapes the Southern individual who goes there. These reflections flow smoothly into observations about some of the harsh realities of the North, poverty, alcoholism, starvation, racism, and sexism, close quote. Romanticism about the malevolent North is an important facet of the idea of North, which Gould explores in the following clip. Perceptive person who wanders about the North and gets to know the Northerners a little bit is bound to have some of his old illusions shattered. If his illusions are based on the kind of romantic approach that we traditionally got from the, the books and the school room, the stories I mean about the, the lovely Eskimos and their gleaming white igloos and how life is simple and unspoiled and unchanged and so on. Well, that kind of life is really ugly, ugly, ugly. And you can't have all your illusions about the charming old life when you go up and see the tuberculosis and when you see the wretched health conditions, the wretched living conditions, the unspeakable sanitation. When you see the racial distinctions between a sort of white master race and the lesser breeds that have always been kept just a little outside the law. I'm not blaming anybody for this, unless I blame us all collectively. But there's a lot in that romantic tradition that, in my mind, was pretty ugly, judged by today's standards. seemed like a very romantic place to me and this was one of the reasons why I wanted to go north because considering a place romantic means that one doesn't know too much about it. I had read a great deal about it and it sounded very very romantic to me and I suppose in a way I was influenced by this and when I arrived it was a cold September day. It was snowing in Coral Harbor and there was absolutely no one there to meet me. I stepped off the plane and there were a number of rugged looking men with 
beards, wearing heavy parkas and boots. And here was I, this frail little girl from Winnipeg who came to the north to help the Eskimos. And at that moment, I think I was more in need of help than anyone else. I felt absolutely lost. I don't know. I think that it's something like marriage, I guess. Uh, a person who romanticizes or idealizes his uh, girlfriend, right? Uh, and refuses to, uh, quote, see reality. And his parents say, well, look, you know, your teeth are falling out and so on. Uh, a person refuses to see this uh, and insists on marrying the girl, to, discovers after a while that, uh, you know, the parents were right, perhaps. <laughs> and and uh, so he gets disenchanted, right? I must be out of my mind to come to this place. What will I do? Here the North is positioned as a locus of Southerners' romantic illusions and the impossibility of maintaining them in the face of actual experience of the North. The position of intergenerational responsibility for the appalling conditions of many indigenous Northerners still live, as a result of assimilationist policies of resettlement and residential schooling, is not present in this 1967 work. The documentary has been praised for its polyphonic vocality, but indigenous voices are largely relegated to the background soundscape, along with the howling wind and the barking huskies. And the Inuit are represented as helpless victims overall. There's no attempt to portray a vital, positive, you know, modern kind of, of society. The, the North is your, the, the wife you married by mistake. This is a feminized other. My second example also emphasizes settler interpretations of the North. In the late 20th century, Armory Schaefer was by far Canada's best known composer internationally. And the idea of North permeates his work, particularly his Patria series of environmental music theater works composed and realized between 1965 and 2015. For this brief illustration, however, I'll discuss an example from Schaefer's experimental choral music. Snow Forms was composed in 1981 and revised in 1983. The text of this a cappella choral work consists of Inuit words for different types of snow. The graphic score is made up of snowdrift-like curved lines rather than traditional notation. Snowforms is paradigmatic of Schaefer's concept of muse ecology. He writes that, quote, an ecologically responsive music would reduce its dependence on foreign materials as much as foreign inspiration and seek both closer to home, close quote. Here, Schaefer adopts both an ultra-Canadian climate trope, snow, and words from the Inuktitut language. So let's listen to a very short excerpt. its swooping pure women's voices singing close dissonant harmonies, mainly non-vibrato and arrhythmically, Snow Forms fits Grace's description of any number of 20th century Canadian northern compositions as displaying, quote, the qualities of snow, ice, extremes of cold, isolation, space, silence, austerity, beauty, and dread, close quote. And for Schaefer, the idea of North is an explicitly nationalist ideology. In his 1977 polemical prose poem, Music in the Cold, he writes, I am a northerner. With my axe, I resist the environment, shape a log house, and cut firewood to warm it. My heart is pure, my mind as cool as an icebox, and the cold of the forest will be in me until my extinction. 
Schaefer's poem, composed during his own back to the land move to rural South Central Ontario, echoes the words of a 19th century Canadian nationalist, R.G. Halliburton, champion of the Canada First Movement, and particularly his lecture of 1889, The Men of the North and Their Place in History. Quote, a glance at the map of this continent, as well as that the history of the past, will satisfy us that the peculiar characteristic of the new dominion must ever be that it is a northern country inhabited by the descendants of northern races. Close quote. For Halliburton, however, northern races meant northern Europeans, and like many of his contemporaries, he considered geography and climate to be determinants of racial strength and superiority. This polemic is both deeply disturbing and bizarrely contemporary given Trump's recent comments on immigration. It calls to mind Canada's discriminatory immigration policy, which until 1967 highly favored European and US immigrants. It is also a gendered masculine discourse, something that Atwood also identifies in Canada North literature. The idea of North arguably also underpins the creation of our Canadian national institutions. And I turn now to a slightly different topic, the influence of public arts funding on experimental music, specifically the Canada Council for the Arts. Funding, of course, is a significant factor in the arts ecosystem. And there is a fascinating symposis between arts practices and arts funding that I'll try to unpack here. Now, a history of the Canada Council is beyond the scope of this presentation, but I'll provide just a little bit of background. And for those who like that sort of thing, I've created a handout of my very idiosyncratic timeline. The Canada Council for the Arts was formed in 1957 at the recommendation of the Royal Commission on National Development in the Arts, Letters, and Sciences, submitted by Raymond Massey and Henri-Georges Levesque in 1951. The so-called Massey Report detailed the results of years of cross-country consultation into the state of Canadian culture. And its recommendations were designed to be a bulwark against the overwhelming influence of the United States and Europe via mass production in the wake of the Second World War. As Jeremy Strawn has neatly summarized, behind the Massey Report was a narrative of civilizing culture that focused on good art as a defense against the homogenizing effects of mass culture even as it recognized that the role of, that communications technology, such as radio and television, could play in informing and educating Canadians. As Strawn states, the commissioners acknowledged the need to, quote, protect the integrity and identity of Canadian regionalisms within a broader nationalist envelope, close quote. But their vision of Canadian culture was largely limited to its French-English foundations. The roles of indigenous peoples and other immigrant groups were largely obscured. The Massey Report had extraordinary impact and resulted in the founding of several important nation-building institutions, including the Canada Council for the Arts. Council's parliamentary mandate is, quote, to foster and promote the study and enjoyment of and the production of works in the arts. The Council was founded on a Eurocentric model of promoting the fine and performing arts with an emphasis on professionalization. Originally, four disciplines were funded ballet, classical music, theater, and visual arts. In music, this meant composers, performers of classical music, orchestras, and opera companies. Originally conceived as the Canada Council for the Encouragement of the Arts, Letters, Humanities, and Social Sciences, this public funding body was actually formed with revenues from the death duties of industrialists Sir James Dunn and Isaac Walton Killam, but has been funded by annual parliamentary appropriations since 1964. It has had a continuous relationship with UNESCO through the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, also created in 1957 and overseen by Council. As such, Council cooperates in an international arena with the explicitly ecological goal to, quote, promote the sustainable development of society through the arts, culture, equity, and peace. The creation of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, our beloved SHRC, in 1978, narrowed the scope of the Canada Council to the Arts. I say beloved because the Shirk funded my research. It is at arm's length from, but accountable to, the Department of Canadian Heritage. That's the Canada Council. The Canada Council structure includes an 11-member board led by a director who is also a chief executive officer, 
and many board and staff members are themselves artists who provide important links between on-the-ground practices and the institution. Now, this is important. Granting decisions are made by peer assessment committees made up of independent artists and other arts professionals and selected by program officers. To prevent undue influence, peer assessors can only serve once every 24 months. During the 1970s, two cross-disciplinary programs were created that significantly affected the ecology of the arts in Canada, the Touring Office and the Explorations section. The Touring Office recognized the particular challenges of disseminating art in a vast and sparsely populated country. The Exploration section was designed to support risk-taking, innovative arts ventures. Many now-established Canadian contemporary arts organizations were founded under this program, for example, Canada's national network of artist-run centres, including the Western Front in Vancouver and the Music Gallery in Toronto, both important sites for experimental music. The section also had a specific regional focus on the North. After a mid-1990s program review, and in a climate of financial austerity, the Council was reorganized along disciplinary lines, mainly as an efficiency measure. It took fewer staff to fund music if all music grants were run under the same administrative structure. What was lost, however, was the on-the-ground regional perspective provided by the exploration section. This disciplinary structure was ill-equipped to respond to the rapidly shifting ecology of the fine and performing arts, which showed increasing interdisciplinary tendencies, in part driven by emerging digital technologies. By the early 2000s, however, this interdisciplinarity was recognized with the founding of the inter-art section. In early 2016, I interviewed Aimé Dantigny, an experimental electronic musician who joined council staff in 2007 and has risen to the post of a section director. Dantigny, who describes his job as applied cultural studies, outlined the intricate relationship between government, council, and artists. He spoke frankly about the slow evolution of arts funding policy, stating, quote, our policies and procedures don't allow us to be that reactive. In fact, policy change is always in response to lobbying, surges in volume, or a gradual overall change in how the artists on the ground approach the characterization of how to do their art, close quote. By the early 21st century, the music section had amassed an enormous list of musical genres that were, were or were not deemed eligible for funding. There were small victories for experimental practice. First, Quebec's distinctive improvisation music, Musique Actuelle, was given its own genre category, and then audio art was acknowledged. However, perceived commercial genres such as soul, hip-hop, rock, R&B, and heavy metal were explicitly ineligible for funding. Such artists were steered towards industry funding programs such as Factor, regardless of the innovative or experimental content of their work. Dantigny described this policy in what he called Foucauldian terms. Quote, we were trying to regulate the behavior of practicing artists in terms of aesthetic to access funding. I thought that was quite an admission. Staff knew that council could not keep pace with diversifying arts practice. In 2000, experimental composer Martin Arnold was commissioned to write a research report for council that he entitled, Alternative New Music Practices in Canada. What makes them alternative and how could they be more effectively engaged by the Canada Council? Arnold spoke to a wide variety of experimental music and sound practitioners across Canada and reported to Council that the only thing they had in common was, quote, a skewed relationship to discipline. Whether it is self slash ideological or not, the artists I am considering approach musical traditions slash disciplines as we commonly receive them in this culture, critically, experimentally, and often to varying degrees, subversively, close quote. By 2007, encouraged by then-director Ross Kelly, the music section adopted an official policy of genrelessness. Any type of professional musician could, in principle, approach council for funding as long as they could prove that their work was making an innovative contribution to Canadian music. Since the funding pie had not grown significantly larger in that time, this opening up of eligibility caused much consternation among artists and very interesting discussions in peer assessment committees, as I recall from the time. 
Ironically, Dantigny told me that it is often experimental musicians on peer assessment committees who are the most severe judges of applications by other experimentalists. So it's really not a, an easy top-down or bottom-up, or like it's very, very entangled. And today, the Canada Council for the Arts, of course, is just one funder in what it calls the Canadian arts ecosystem. In truth, applicants to music grants have a slim 20% chance of success. Artists are also expected to get funding from provincial and municipal arts councils, from private donations and ticket revenue. The prevalent discourse is one of accountability, both financially to Canadian taxpayers and morally to Canadian values. In 2017, Council implemented the biggest restructuring of its programs since its inception 60 years ago. The new structure works across not only genre, but artistic discipline, emphasizing outcomes, the effects of arts on Canadians. Applicants are explicitly encouraged to address social criteria such as ethnic diversity, indigeneity, minority languages, and deaf and disability arts. And Council has created policy documents on each of these equity issues for the benefit of peer assessment committees. Although the Trudeau government will effectively double Council's parliamentary appropriation over the next five years, it appears that this reorganization is somewhat of a survival strategy, motivated by the perceived need to make a strong defense for public arts funding. As Dantigny explains, that's another thing that has become very obvious since the early 2000s, is that everything that underpinned the necessity of public intervention in some sectors, that is, the clear understanding coming out of the Second World War, that public education, public arts funding, public works, public health were all important pillars that would prevent fascism from ever taking hold again in Western societies. That has disappeared. People don't remember why things like UNESCO or Council or all those kind of more Canadian interventionist things were so readily put into place." Close quote. And this is the environment in which my third and final example of the idea of North in experimental music was created. I contend that we can hear the changing idea of North in the 21st century in Inuit throat singer Tanya Tagak's improvisational performance with percussionist and electronic musician Jean Martin and violinist Jesse Zubat to reinterpret Robert J. Flaherty's 1922 film, Nanook of the North, a mainly fictional docudrama that is widely considered to be foundational to the documentary film genre. The work, which includes an electroacoustic component by composer Derek Chark, was commissioned by the Tiff Bell Lightbox in 2012 as part of its film retrospective on First People Cinema, 1,500 Nations, One Tradition. Tagak, Martin, and Zubat have toured the work internationally since then, in some cases with support from the Canada Council. Flaherty's film is a most fascinating blend of fact and fiction that I can only gloss here. I'll play a clip from the film silently while I tell you about him. It's a scene where Nanook and his family build an igloo. Robert J. Flaherty was born in Michigan and educated in Canada. Working as a surveyor for the Northern Railroad starting in 1910, Flaherty made several expeditions to the Canadian North, beginning with Ungava Bay. He traveled long distances by dog sled, and in 1913, he returned to the region by boat on the Newfoundland schooner Laddie, an epic voyage that included wintering over in Amadjuac Bay on Baffin Island. Flaherty writes, quote, through the 10 months of winter, we had enough to do. There were 2,000 miles inland to the Great Lake of Amadjuac. There, too, was the task of filming as much as might be of the lives of the Eskimos." Close quote. His boss, Sir William Mackenzie, had encouraged him to bring filming equipment on the voyage, but he probably didn't count on his employee becoming quite so obsessed. Flaherty auditioned the locals and selected a group that would act the parts of a family and he filmed them building igloos, hunting, and fishing. His first attempt at assembling a long film about the Inuit went up in flames during the editing process, a, a single uh, ember from a cigarette. <laughs> uh, but he eventually raised the funds to return to Ungava Bay in 1920, where he repeated the process of assembling a select group of Inuit actors. The film was financed by the fur company Vrevian Frère and released by Pathé. Flaherty hired an Inuk man named Alakarialak to play the character Nanook, 
a mighty hunter, and other locals to play members of Nanook's family. This time he had a much clearer idea of how to structure the narrative, and he brought not only cameras, but portable developing and printing machine and some lighting equipment. Working under extraordinary conditions, he created a haunting portrait of the northern landscape that portrays its indigenous inhabitants as brave, happy, ingenious, and tough. Tanya Tagak is moved that the film shows the amazing ability of her Inuit ancestors to survive, as she puts it, in the harshest of environments, but also notes with typical bluntness that the film presents, quote, a bunch of bullshit happy Eskimo stereotypes. Flaherty showed the rushes to his Inuit actors, and they became actively involved with the filming as technicians, camera operators, film developers, and production consultants. The film, in fact, depicts a pre-European contact way of life, including a dangerous walrus hunt with harpoons, where the Inuit had already been hunting with rifles for many years. However, it was released not as a work of fiction, but as a true-to-life drama, a narrative that was reinforced by Flaherty's memoir, My Friends, the Eskimos, written with his wife Frances in the form of an exciting adventure tale and published in 1924. Flaherty never reveals that Nanook is the name that he gave to the actor, Alak Arialak. He maintains the fiction throughout the book. Nanook of the North was wildly successful, and Flaherty went on to make similar docudramas in the South Seas and in Ireland. Despite its stereotypical representation of the malevolent North, film scholar Michelle Raheja thinks that, quote, the film and its off-screen stories have had a lasting positive impact on Inuit communities, most likely because of the depth of their participation in its creation. Peter Pizziolak, an Inuit photographer from Cape Dorset, met Flaherty in 1912 and was inspired to learn photography as a result. His stunning, intimate photographs of community members in the 1930s and 40s militate against images of Arctic people that framed them as archaic, primitive, and doomed peoples." Close quote. So how has Tanya Tagak reclaimed Nanook of the North? Tagak, whose mother is Inuit and whose father is of British and Polish descent, first heard Inuit throat singing when her mother sent her a cassette while she was an art student at school in Nova Scotia. She was raised in the north, mainly in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. She states, quote, not a lot of people spoke or still speak in Inuitnaktun, and there was no throat singing. Now people are starting to use their Inuk names again, but back in the day, that wasn't where it was at. People thought it was cool to be white, and I can kind of understand it. That's how colonialism works, close quote. Tagak adapted throat singing into an innovative solo form that has caused a few ripples among traditional Inuit throat singers and inspired others to incorporate throat singing into diverse musical genres. Over many years of working in the experimental music scene, Tagak has in fact considerably expanded her range of vocal techniques. She really is a peer of people like Christine Duncan and Paul Dutton uh, and uh, uh, Senko Namchalak. I want to play the trailer that the Tiff Bell Lightbox produced to promote the 2012 premiere of the work. It's a great way to introduce you to Tagak and her collaborators, two of the most active performer producers on the Canadian experimental music scene, who have worked with her since 2010, percussionist Jean Martin and violinist Jesse Zubat. Tagak, Martin, and Zubat freely improvise over a soundscape composed by Derek Chark. Chark explains that, quote, I created the soundscape using sounds I recorded in the north of dogs and birds and the wind, but there's a form and a shape. Tanya went to the studio first and improvised to the film. She sent me those improvisations, and I took them as a guideline of the way she would navigate through the score. I manipulated some of her sounds as well. The soundscape sounds the same, but she improvises on top." Close quote. Chark's soundscape could be considered analogous to the background sounds representing the North that one hears in Glenn Gould's radio docudrama. It is designed to represent the Northern environment, Another parallel is that the texture of the three improvising performers is thoroughly polyphonic. The striking difference, of course, is the prominence of an Inuit voice. Tagak describes the backing track, as she calls it, as, quote, a sonic bed we get to lay on while we're improvising on top of it. Thank <laughs> you. 
to Gag's collaborators to you now because that's the last time they appear in the narrative. In a curious inversion of the film Nanook of the North, all the considerable critical attention and credit is given to Tagak, who is positioned as a diva, a kind of Inuit Bjork whose band need not be mentioned. It reinforces her position as a musician who these days performs experimental music in the context of the commercial popular music industry. Her album Animism, on which she also collaborated with Martin and Zubat, in which Zubat produced, won Canada's Polaris Prize for Popular Music in 2014. When we listen to Tanya Tagak and to Nenok of the North, we can hear how experimental music performance in Canada has infiltrated the popular mainstream. A strange new polar punk star is born. Positioning Tagak's experimentalism in terms of a pop diva is a fascinating sign of the increased blurring of genre boundaries in the 21st century. It's also interestingly at odds with the inherently co-creative musical structure of free improvisation, which is built on sympoetic responsibility to recall Donna Haraway's terms. Tagak's improvisation is intricately bound up with Martin's beats and computer samples and Zubat's violin and viola loops. Their superb musicianship enables her shamanic performance and vice versa. The trio has been improvising since at least 2010 when they were performed at the Festival de Musique Actuelle in Victoriaville, Quebec, with equal billing for all three musicians. I played the live recording of that concert just before this talk. With Tanya Tagak and Nanook of the North, music industry marketing and musical aesthetics make strange bed bedfellows. But another way to interpret Tagak's reclamation of Nanook of the North is as an audible and visible repositioning of power that productively inverts historical settler-colonial relations. On this view, Tagak would seem to exemplify Ralston Saul's ideal of animism as a sign of progressive post-national identity. Tagak is a powerful and dramatic performer whose stage persona is, like the title of her 2014 album, Animistic. Mary Dickey describes her in performance, quote, she unleashes something fierce and powerful that comes from deep within her body, yet seems positively unearthly. She mostly improvises her performance, tapping into traditional Inuit throat singing, growling, cooing, howling, and manipulating her breath into frenetic rhythms, but adapting it to create a hybrid that sounds simultaneously animal and alien, ancient and modern. It's visceral, earthy, and unabashedly sexual, frightening, mesmerizing, and exhilarating." Close quote. Now I want to listen to a clip from Nanook of the North, which Tagak recorded in cooperation with the Banff Center for the Arts for broadcast on BBC Radio 3 in 2015. In this clip, it is deepest winter, and Nanook is hunting a seal through a hole in the ice to feed his starving family. Note Tagak's solo interpretation of Inuit throat singing and how her performance positions the seal hunt. And uh, Spencer, we'll ask you to crank the volume here a little bit, because I think this needs to be heard uh, at a kind of... <laughs>
Bigak's performance follows the rest of her oeuvre in a, forging a deeply emotional bond with the animal subject. Tagak isn't just improvising, she's identifying with, nay giving birth to that seal, performatively signaling her Inuit identity that is so tied up with the seal hunt. She is performing sympoesis, an act of making with, that acknowledges multi-species codependence. Tagak has used her profile to advocate for the seal hunt and Inuit sustainability and also to call attention to the now widespread outrage over missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada. To be sure, her performance of sexualized femininity is mediated through the conventions of popular music, but it is one over which Tagak has exquisite control. Her white male collaborator's apparent willingness to step out of the limelight is also a sign of the times. Conversations about ethnic, gender, and sexual diversity are currently prominent in the contemporary music scene as evidenced by the Canadian New Music Forum's cross-country dialogues on the subject held in Halifax, Montreal, and Vancouver in 2017. But I want to end this example by recalling Ochoa Gautier's caution about a too idealistic ecologization of sound by playing you the opening titles of the BBC Banff recording. Can you spot the neocolonialism at work here? The titles announced that in the 1920s, American filmmaker Robert J. Flaherty recorded the lives of a Canadian Inuit family. His film documents a way of life in a brutal environment, just as it was disappearing forever. The BBC's opening titles reframe Flaherty's fiction as fact. We are presented with a truthful documentation of the lives of an indigenous Canadian family from a culture on the brink of extinction. The North is once again represented as a malevolent environment, its inhabitants as victims. In one swift move, Tanya Tagak and Nanook of the North is transformed from a vibrant celebration of First Peoples cinema to an homage to Flaherty's masterful documentation of a lost people. The romantic idea of North, it seems, is remarkably persistent. To end on a less cynical note, let me quote from Simon Bro, current director of the Canada Council for the Arts who gave an address on the state of the arts in Canada 2017 at last year's Winnipeg New Music Festival. Bro laid out several priorities of council, including internationalization and a huge investment in digital technology. Citing the social responsibilities of the Canada Council, Bro stated that, quote, we have an obligation and a responsibility to act, to transform the council to better support indigenous artists and communities on their own terms to invite the arts to fulfill a significant role in a journey of conciliation and decolonization. It will be fascinating to see and hear how Indigenous and other experimental musicians in Canada respond. And I note this tone of invitation, this tone of solicitation still coming from the, the institutional body to, the, to artists, where artists are always you know, many steps ahead of the institution. Anyway. That's as far as I've got with thinking about this, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for just a fascinating talk. We have time for question and answer. Uh, we'll take questions both from the uh, audience here and folks <laughs> over uh, uh, from the uh, from the internet. I'd like to say that we've had a little bit of a problem with our YouTube channel recently. Uh, the chat room doesn't work as well as we'd like, so if you're watching via the internet, please email your questions to our institutional account, mmap at mun.ca, mmap at mun.ca. But let's start with a question from the gallery. I was reminded of the story of Abraham Ulrikab, um, who, uh, who was the first Inuit autobiography, I guess, the diary that he kept in 1880, when he and his family were taken to Europe to be exhibited in zoos as ethnographic uh, examples of, uh, you know, primitive, uh, rather like the BBC titles yeah. as you put up yeah. there, you know, yeah. A Vanishing Way of Life in a Brutal Environment and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's quite symbolic that, that uh, now there's, there's an effort to repatriate 
um, what can be traced of their remains back to Labrador. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's the whole, you know, project of reclaiming history and, and, and bringing forth the voices of people who have been silenced in the past. But what fascinates me about what Degak is doing, and, and she's not alone, is a, the, the kind of play, playfulness on all the signification, right? She's just playing with every possible cliche here and, and sort of turning it on its ear, right? So she's turning it into something new all the time and she's working with just anybody she feels like working with in order to do it and changing her, uh, her script sometimes about what, what, you know, what matters to her right now. Sometimes it's sexuality, sometimes it's motherhood, sometimes it's in murdered and missing indigenous women. But it's always this sense of modern, modernity. It's always about living now, about changing, living, vibrant being now and, and not about a sort of nostalgia for the past or, or, or anything like that. It's really about a kind of urgency of now. Yeah. We have a question uh, from the internet. Uh, Megan Forsyth, could you like to read it for us? So this is a question from Annie Greenwood. And she actually has a few questions. But I'll, I'll start with one. In the examples provided, the clip of uh, Tagak's Nanook of the North example has a strong pulse, whereas Gould's idea of North has the cadence of speech and swirling environmental noise. How do other more recent musical examples bring human ex presence, especially the, into portrayals of women and female identifying people, into their depictions of the North? Oh, gosh. Thanks, Annie. That's a difficult question. Um, well, I think a lot of the, the interesting work that I'm hearing is coming out of the realm of what we might loosely call indie rock. So the kind of shows that I might hear on the midnight concerts at a, a festival like uh, the FIMAF. Uh, and so the, the idea of, of kind of playing with rock beats or playing with that kind of steady rhythmic foundation is, is something that sort of is seen as, I think, as energizing the work, right? So we're making it accessible, perhaps, to a certain kind of audience. Um, Gould's use of, of sort of eschewing of that kind of, of, of beat or anything is, is interesting, too. Of course, it's partly his own musical sensibility. It's weird that the only actual music that he uses in the radio documentary is Sibelius's Fifth Symphony, it's just a very strange kind of, kind of move, except that our own Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra very recently on its Canada 150 concert chose to play a Sibelius Symphony. So I think some of these uh, throwback kind of ideas are remarkably persistent. Uh, I think it would be a fascinating study to, to, to take a look at other contemporary uh, 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 Inuit women's work. Uh, Susan, uh, Susan Aglukark is going to be here in St. John's in a couple of weeks. So. Maybe we'll get to hear. Yeah. Uh, that the BBC would have uh, written its uh, trailer the way it did doesn't surprise me. The Beeb really only knows to be patriarchal or patronizing. It's, it's one or the other, it would seem. Uh, but did anybody speak out against that? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I'm waiting for Jessica Perea Bissette's, uh, Bissette Perea's work on this to come out. She has interviewed Tagak and she's done intensive work on this, but the, the article's not published yet. I don't know. Somebody either made a mistake somewhere and nobody noticed, or uh, the BBC wasn't talking to the Banff Center and nobody was talking to Tagak and Martin and Zubat. I mean, it is the most astonishing error, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This question comes from our very own Bev Diamond, all the way from Montreal. She's wondering what you might say about the juxtaposition and hence relationship of genres into Gack's work. Is it simply breaking genre boundaries or commenting on relationality? Oh, I think it is commenting on relationality. Um, Degak has done a lot of work uh, with a, a number of sort of gold plate contemporary musicians. For example, the Kronos Quartet with whom she recorded. And there's a very complex discourse about her work with groups like that. Uh, there's a, a, a weird little video that bears analysis of the Kronos Quartet kind of saying, no, Tanya, don't learn to read music because that will ruin what you do. It will, it will sully your, the purity of your wildness or something like this. Uh, so, there's, so there's weirdness like that. Um, but at the same time, Tagak herself often writes about her practice 
as if it comes from a kind of magical place. I mean, this kind of shamanic imagery or imagery of orgasm or birth is not something I'm just putting on it. It's the way she talks about her own practice. And I think that she, perhaps in the kind of representations that you do in media interviews, you know, when you're sort of telling a particular kind of narrative, we lose a little bit any kind of deeper discourse about the collaboration that she's doing with her fellow musicians. So I, I really, ha I've not interviewed Tanya Tagak about this particular work, although I have talked informally to some of the other musicians. And I would love to get her take on the collaborative nature of this music making. Because it's been a long sustained development of her ability to do this kind of improvising. She improvises differently now than she did when I heard her in a, a large ad hoc group session at the Guelph Jazz Festival maybe seven years ago. She's much more comfortable and she's established a kind of a position for herself, kind of, kind of where, the, where the rest of the music making comes through her, right? So, there, so there's, there's this kind of a discourse. And I really think also that it's, a, it's the kind of work musicians have to do to make a career to position themselves within a genre, to sell an album like Animism, to you know, stake out a claim in the, the popular music world, even if it is on the experimental fringes of that. So you know, there is something that the industry does to you to make a focal point on a singer or to put a particular person as the front person of a collaborative endeavor. So the question I have, that's one for my research, and, and I'll put it to you as well, and it always challenges me, is around definitions of the North. Yeah. Because on the one hand, we have this idealized, imagined North that doesn't need a boundary, it doesn't need a definition. And on the other hand, we have funding agencies that have a regional council for the North, or a North region, or funding agencies that identify the North as a research site or whatever. And so I'm just curious for you, in the work that you've done, is there... What is the usefulness, or is there a point in trying to define what North is, or what the North is? I'm not trying contexts? to come down to any particular kind of a definition. In fact, I think the very interesting thing here is how slippery that, that trope is, and how strategically it gets deployed for, by different stakeholders for different reasons, as you've said. Because, of course, the North is also people's home, right? And it's also sovereign territory. It's Nunavut. It's Nunatsiavut. It's self-governance. It's a, it's a place where lots of different kinds of people live and work. And it's also a place where other new Canadians go to immigrate and work and live. So as, as you know from your own research, Jeff, it, it's, it's, there's no one, one kind of narrative. I think there is a danger, certainly, in some of these attempts to pin the idea of North onto a particular ideal, you know, that we're back to the Canada first kind of thing, or the Make America Great movement, or something like that, right? Any of that kind of jingoism is obviously a place where terms get frozen, and then they really can do damage. They can really be used as a clout against somebody. I've really mixed feelings about John Ralston Saul's endeavor and the, this, this uh, a charity of, uh, for Canadian citizenship. It's very attractive in many ways. It's holding all these kinds of forums to talk about diversity and to talk about ways that people can you know, honor different voices and different kinds, all of which I think is fantastic. It's, it's just interestingly how kind of murky it gets when it, when it becomes about a definition of Canada and a way for Canada to take the high moral ground on the world stage. That's, that's where it gets a little icky to me, but maybe that's just because I'm a Canadian, right? And we, we think these kinds of things are icky. It's oh, a great question. This may not be a question. I just, I'm, I'm curious about the whole restructure of the Canada Council. I'm oh. following a lot of debates on, on Facebook now, and my friends are, um, some of them are very up in arms about it. Everyone's freaked out, that's for everybody's sure. Everybody's freaked oh. out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have my own opinion. I'm quite happy with the changes, but uh, I, I find it interesting, particularly in ex, what people consider experimental m music and how that is being uh, challenged, actually, through the new structure. So this is actually not a question. I'm yeah. more just putting out an observation of what I've seen online yeah. and different... Yeah. Um, How, what it would say, can you be a bit more specific about those anxieties? I mean, are people feeling oh, pe that the social agenda is co-opting the musical well, agenda? Well, they feel that... Well, 
the ones that are against the restructure are, are feeling quite uh, insecure in um, their placement in their practice and how they're being asked or, or, or challenged as to validify their practice. And so they're, they're feeling that they're, the worth of their work is being taken away. Yeah. Some of that... It's, it's not a question. I'm just actually yeah, quite interested by yeah, all the changes. Yeah. It's fascinated me as well. Um, and there, it's gone from 146 programs down to six large umbrellas into which everything flows. But there are things like international touring, national touring and dissemination. Uh, explore and create is essentially where artists would go to do their individual projects or where organizations would go who always had some sort of core funding from the council. Um, it, it, engage and sustain is basically how you fund orchestras and opera companies and, and, and the rooms and you know, the sort of big institutions that have a large public kind of thing. And then of course this very specific file for Aboriginal arts, which is, is distinct. I'm forgetting one. There's another one to support organizations that support the arts, things like the Canadian League of Composers or the Canadian Music Centre, those kinds of organizations. But then there is this labyrinthine process where nevertheless you go into a research portal to, to, uh, to apply and you then have to say who you are and what you are. And you have to kind of stick with that once you say, I'm in music, oh, maybe I'm not an inter-arts anymore, or I'm not a visual artist. Or, so there's this weird push-me-pull-you thing that I'm not sure that people at council have completely sorted either, frankly. They've been very frank mm -hmm. about the fact that everybody there is kind of beta-testing this, this, this whole thing. But what, what both Claude Schreier and Aimé Dantigny told me, the two people that I interviewed there who are fairly high up in the structure, both of them really said that we have to defend ourselves. I really got the sense that council, perhaps before this promise of new funding from the Trudeau government, had felt that they really had to justify their existence and they found, felt that all these little programs made it really difficult to kind of get the message across. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, this is not very different from what we see happening in oh, I don't know, universities. <laughs> you know, it's this kind of, yeah. kind of drive to sort of, of accountability, of, of totting everything up, of making everybody sort of, you know, say what their outcomes are going to be. Yeah. And I, think, I do have a little bit of, of uh, nostalgia, though I was a child at the time, for this climate of the 1970s with the Explorations Program, where I really think amazing things happened in a pretty wild and woolly arts funding environment that probably wasn't very accountable, but that kind of allowed a group of improvising musicians in Toronto to decide to start the music gallery, mm -hmm. you know, or a bunch of people who wanted to buy a house in Vancouver to start an inter-arts organization <laughs> called the Western Front. Yeah. It'll be fascinating to see whether this works. I, 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 that's what yeah. I agree with, too. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated to see yeah. where this will go. Yeah. I, I personally think there are positive changes. Yeah. I do like the changes, but we'll, yeah. we'll see where it goes. Yeah. I, I do also want to just say, I, I, from what I can see, I do think that hearts are in the right places in terms yes. of the people charged with doing the work in the Canada Council. Yeah. I realize that this, uh, I'm not an ethnomusicologist, I'm just a documentary guy. So I, this may be a naive question, but, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I noted that Tanya Tagak encountered throat singing later, you know, didn't grow up with it. Um, it reminded me of, of uh, drum dancing in Labrador. I mean, that was a, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, it, it, a music and, and a cultural expression that's been pulled back from, yeah. from the past. And a few years ago, I was talking to Martin Carthy, the, uh, the British folk singer, and I was surprised and struck by, we were talking about uh, musical tradition. And he said, oh, he said, uh, our folk music tradition in the UK, he said, that's really, that, that's a broken tradition. Uh, compared to Newfoundland, he said, where you have an unbroken mm. folk tradition. And he talked uh, he had an, about an assumed idea of authenticity that was necessary, I guess he felt, or was somehow valued 
uh, by him in, in, uh, in a way that uh, we see his tradition as being less authentic. Mm. Uh, and I wonder, do you think that, that that idea has any application at all now with any of this, or is that really uh, passe? I think it's a really complex environment and not one that I'm an expert in all over. But Bev Diamond has written really well of this about issues about throat singing, which was, if, I understand, if I'm quoting Bev correctly or paraphrasing Bev correctly, was a, a sort of a not-for-profit activity, right? It was a game that was played between two women, and, and it was, so it had a kind of a particular setting, a particular social setting and a particular social value is also a way that uh, a, a very sophisticated way for teaching linguistics or for teaching about the environment through the, the types of images and sounds that were, were used. And it was, there, there were, uh, was a meeting, I'm going to get the dates of this wrong, but there was a meeting in the early 2000s of, of, of Inuit women to discuss the issues of copyright around throat singing. Right? That, and, and, a, and a sort of wish that there was a, a way of not monetizing or not capitalizing on this tradition. And so there's a, there's a real tension there between innovative experimental uses of throat singing as it's been reconceived by, say, young hip-hop artists who are Inuit, or by someone like Tanya Tagak, and this kind of long tradition and, and different way of understanding it. There, there, there's a flaw in this talk. It's just too long already, right? One should really carefully go through what throat singing is and how it, it has been practiced for millennia by, by my Inuit women. Uh, and in another version of a talk, this talk, I do that. So Tagak's work can seem to come out of left field like that. But I think she sees it as a link. She sees it as definitely a, a practice that, that links her back to her, her upbringing culture. So yet, is there value, again, in a hard idea of this is authentic, this is not? I don't think so. But is there a discourse about it? Is there concerns? Absolutely. Yeah. I wonder, Carolyn, have you encountered the, these uh, conversations in, in, uh, at Alienate, the festival you're looking at in, yeah. in the north? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. The, just thinking of the, the festival, um, in uh, in Norway that that I've been to um, Ridu Ridu, Yoik is uh, is a, a a vocal practice of the Sami, and the same the same questions of authenticity are are uh, and debates um, are going on there. Like, yeah. I, I will say that there is a great opportunity, uh, if I can give a plug, uh, to hear a variety of different indigenous uh, artists talk about this, both these issues of freedom and responsibility. Uh, Bev Diamond is um, uh, producing a colloquium on July 4th and 5th in this very room, uh, just before the Sound Symposium, with indigenous artist scholars from across North America, from a Taiwan, a Taiwanese background, and also from Sami uh, land, and, and uh, who will be discussing exactly these fraught issues of copyright, of tradition, of what's appropriate practice in a given indigenous legal frame, and what's, what's not. Yeah. We have time for uh, one more question here this evening. This is a question from Esme Gilbert. R. Murray Schaefer uses Inuit text in his work, Snow Forms. What are your thoughts or concerns on the ethical issues of him use, choosing to include this language with him being a white Canadian man? Is his use of Inuit language to represent "quote unquote" Canadianness appropriation in your eyes? Oh yeah, well, good, great question, Esme. Thank you. Um, well, again, it's a complicated issue, right? <laughs> I think the discourse that Schaefer has built around his work, where he says, "Look, I'm going to find the materials that are very close to home and use them because that's more authentic than getting my inspiration from a part," is it has often been. Uh, lambasted, really interpreted as wholesale cultural appropriation that he has no right to do. But he's actually also pretty thoughtful about this stuff, and he has actually really uh, tried to imagine a way of articulating identity 
through the, the fabric of the land and the animals and the wind and the rain. And, and, and it's, it's just weird that he just puts people in that same kind of, kind of basket of, of, of sound, right? It's, a, it's certainly of its time, like it, it, but it's not, it's not not being done now. I mean, you could look at Derek Chark's work. Uh, he's got this orchestral piece, 13 Inuit songs, and, and even though he collaborates with, with uh, Inuit throat singers, there are many ways in which that work feels like appropriation, it feels like a kind of mining of these lovely sounds to, for a, a white composer to make his work. So this, this question of ownership of art, ownership of sound, uh, I can see uh, your eyes rolling, Michael. <laughs> and there, there's that aspect of it too, you know. Where do you stop creativity? Where do you stop people from engaging and innovating and experimenting? Where do you draw lines that say, no, you can't go uh, over here? Those, those are huge conversations right now. But yes, there absolutely is a discourse around appropriation in Schaefer's work. Well, that's all we have time for this evening. Thank you once again for just a wonderful talk this evening. I'd like to thank our social media host, Dr. Megan Forsyth, our uh, direct video director, uh, Spencer Crew, camera operators, Christian Dauble and Alan McCutcheon, and all of you for coming out this evening. If you missed any part of tonight's talk, you can see it on our YouTube channel, where, where it will be posted in the next few weeks. I'd like to wish all of you and a couple of sprites a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.